The woman known to history as Diana, Princess of Wales, was born on the 1st of July 1961 as Diana Frances Spencer at Park House inside the royal estate at Sandringham in the county of Norfolk in England. Her father was Edward John Spencer, who was born on the 24th of January 1924 into the nobility as Viscount Altrop, having been the only son of the 7th Earl Spencer. The Spencer family was one of the most significant aristocratic lines in Britain, being descended from John Churchill, 1st Duke of Marlborough, one of the foremost statesmen and generals of Europe during the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Edward John spent his late teens during the first years of the Second World War at the Royal Military College in Sandhurst, before serving as a captain in the Royal Scots Greys Regiment, where he was recognized for his admirable contribution to the war effort. During the Allied invasion of Europe in the summer of 1944, to open a Western Front in France against the Nazis, from there, he led a British Army unit in an operation that successfully liberated two French towns. After the war, Spencer was assistant to the Governor of South Australia from 1947 to 1950, before holding local state offices such as County Councillor, High Sheriff for Northamptonshire, and Justice of the Peace for Norfolk. Between 1950 and 1954, Spencer was a personal attendant to both King George VI and Queen Elizabeth II, before he inherited his late father's title as 8th Earl Spencer in 1975, consequently joining the governmental House of Lords until his death on the 29th of March 1992. Diana's mother was Frances Ruth Roche. She was born on the 20th of January 1936, also at Park House, Sandringham, and was the daughter of a baron who forged a good friendship with King George VI. Her mother was a lady-in-waiting to his queen consort. At the age of 18, Francis married the Viscount Otrop at Westminster Abbey. They had five children, Sarah, born in 1955, Jane, who followed two years later, their first son, John, who was born in 1960, but tragically died just hours after his birth, Diana, a year later, and finally, Charles in 1964. They divorced in 1967 and both went on to remarry. A royal journalist reported that violent outbursts from the Viscount may have caused the marriage to fail, with Diana witnessing her father slapping her mother at least once, although custody of their children was awarded to the Viscount, and Frances lived the rest of her life relatively secluded on the Scottish island of Sale. Despite her relocation, a drink-driving ban and conflicts with Diana occasionally brought Frances into the press limelight, but she was largely left to focus on charity work until her death on the 3rd of June 2004. Her own parents' experience meant that Diana grew up as a child of divorce and was aware of the complications which can follow, but nothing could have prepared her for the difficulties which her own unhappy marriage would create from the mid-1980s onwards. Diana grew up at a time when Britain was experiencing wide-ranging changes politically, culturally, socially and economically. The context of the second half of the 20th century was one of Britain rebuilding after the shock and devastation left by the Second World War, coupled with the birth of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States and its allies like Britain, and fueled by the conflicting ideologies of democracy and communism. Compulsory national military service and food rationing remained prevalent in Britain throughout the second half of the 1940s and into the early 1950s. However, the accession of Queen Elizabeth II at just 25 years of age in 1952 in many ways was a turning point in the history of Britain during the 20th century. In the years that followed, renewed economic growth began and by the time the decade ended, prospects for ordinary British people had improved greatly, with low unemployment, higher wages, and better living conditions and entertainment. Then, when the 1960s arrived, there was a social revolution, with music, fashion, and attitudes all changing. There was more spending on luxuries, and the majority of households now had televisions, meaning Diana grew up as mass media truly arrived, giving people ready access to the Beatles, 
BBC television, and more details than ever before about the royal family. For instance, it was in 1960, the year before Diana was born, that the first ever royal marriage was televised, that of Queen Elizabeth's sister, Princess Margaret, to Anthony Armstrong Jones, heir to the earldom of Snowdon and an accomplished photographer. The 1970s, however, was a decade of strikes, as trade unions engaged in widespread industrial action brought on by a demand for improved working conditions. Britain's global empire had come to an end following decolonization across Africa and in Northern Ireland, the Troubles, a period of internecine sectarian violence between Roman Catholic Republicans and Presbyterian Unionists, escalated into widespread bombings exchanged with the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, eventually taking the campaign to England itself. To compound matters, from 1973, there was a two-year recession in much of the Western world, driven by inflation, triggered by the world oil crisis, which resulted in higher energy and commodity prices, thereby ending the boom enjoyed in the previous decade. Progressive legislation, including the 1975 Sex Discrimination Act, the 1976 Race Relations Act and the 1979 Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discriminations Against Women were all signs that Britain was attempting to shift to a fairer society. One element that had not significantly changed, however, was the upper-class system and protocols, which was still made up of five ranks of aristocratic nobility, listed in precedence as Duke, Marquis, Earl, Viscount, and Baron. The royal family sat at the top of this hierarchy. All of this ensured that Britain was a changing society by the time Diana came of age, but in some crucial respects, it remained bound to the past. One of the most significant issues was that attitudes towards divorce and marital separation were still old-fashioned in Britain by the 1980s, and this would have a bearing on Diana's later life as the British press became obsessed with the possibility of her and her future husband separating in a manner which would not hold the same attention in the 2020s. Diana's youth was spent enmeshed in British aristocratic life. The Sandringham estate where Queen Elizabeth II leased Park House to the Spencer family was often the scene of royal gatherings, and so Diana grew up accustomed to life in the royal circle even calling the Queen Aunt Lilibet. She also played with two of the Queen's sons, Prince Andrew and Prince Edward, during her younger years, though her eldest son, Charles, the Prince of Wales and heir to the throne, was already entering his teenage years when Diana was born, and so they had no real contact during her youth, being of two significantly different age groups. Diana's parents divorced when she was just seven years old, following which she initially went to live in London with her mother. But shortly thereafter, her father won custody of the Spencer children, and together with her two older sisters and younger brother, Diana returned to Sandringham to live with the future Earl. In 1970, Diana was enrolled at Riddlesworth Hall School, following a few years of homeschooling and a short spell at Sillfield Private School in Norfolk. Four years later, in 1974, she went to boarding school at West Heath near Sevenoaks in Kent, where she showed a talent for music, swimming, and dancing. In her second year, upon the death of her grandfather, she inherited the title Lady, as her father became Earl Spencer and moved into the hereditary Spencer seat at Altrop in Northamptonshire. Despite describing her time at West Heath as the happiest days of her life, Diana struggled academically in many areas and she failed her O-level exams twice before moving to the Institut of Alpin Videmanet in Switzerland during 1977. This was a finishing school designed to prepare pupils for life and the associated courtesies and protocols of upper-class society. In November 1977, there was a grouse hunt at her family estate in Altrop, and Diana was in attendance when her older sister, Sarah, arrived on a date with the heir to the throne, Charles, Prince of Wales. Romance would be short-lived for Sarah, as they would date for only a brief time, with the prince ending the relationship on a skiing trip, and Sarah telling the press that she would never marry him, whether he was, quote, a dustman or the King of England. 
Charles and Diana caught each other's eye for the first time, with Charles describing Diana as jolly, amusing, fun, and attractive, while Diana joked to her friends about marrying him. Some sources suggest that Charles was still in love with Camilla Parker Bowles at this time, despite her marriage to Andrew Parker Bowles four years prior. Charles and Camilla had dated for a time in the early 1970s, but Charles had refrained from proposing to her owing to her family's lack of aristocratic titles and her perceived long dating history, which would contravene the traditional preference of a princess and future queen to carry a virginal, unsullied image when marrying the heir to the throne. As a result of Charles' procrastination, Camilla had moved on and married, but she and Charles, in retrospect, remained the loves of each other's lives and stayed in extensive contact throughout the late 1970s and into the 1980s. In 1978, Diana left school. Thereafter, she tried several low-paid jobs, including becoming a nanny for a wealthy American couple, a dance instructor, a cleaner, a party hostess, and then a nursery teacher's assistant at the Young England School in Pimlico. As a present on her 18th birthday, Diana's mother bought her a flat at Colhearn Court in Earl's Court in Kensington in central London, where she lived with three flatmates. These were years of liberation. Diana had found her childhood largely unhappy and unstable, contending with her parents' abusive marriage and then the separation which followed. In the 1970s, she had a very poor relationship with her stepmother, Rain McCorkadale, who married Diana's father in 1976. Diana described her as a bully, and on one occasion, Rain allegedly pushed her stepdaughter down a flight of stairs. Despite this, Diana had developed from a shy child to a confident and beautiful lady who mingled with aristocratic and powerful people, opening her up to a wide world of potential. In November 1978, Diana was invited to Prince Charles' 30th birthday celebrations at Buckingham Palace, the famed London home of Queen Elizabeth II. Diana was not intimidated by the attendees nor her surroundings, and was fascinated by the company and event, apparently making a good impression of herself on the prince. However, in August 1979, Lord Mountbatten, Charles' great-uncle and a major influence in his early years, was assassinated by the IRA, leaving Charles devastated. He sought comfort from Camilla, which started rumours that the pair had secretly resumed a romantic relationship, one which Camilla's husband, Andrew Parker Bowles, was apparently accepting of, as he himself had also been involved with numerous lovers since beginning his relationship with Camilla. Despite this, during the following year, in July 1980, Charles showered Diana with strong signs of affection when they met again at the home of Philip de Pass, a mutual friend hosting a party in Sussex. Triggering the beginning of their official courtship, Diana was invited to stay with Charles in London where the royal establishment would be asked for approval of the relationship. Two months later, in September 1980, Diana was invited to visit Queen Elizabeth's Scottish residence at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, where the couple received scrutiny from the monarch and her husband, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Charles had clearly invited Diana to meet his parents in order for them to assess her suitability to become his wife at a time when picking who the future queen consort would be was viewed as a political as much as a personal and emotional decision. Private Secretary Lord Charteris was present at the visit, reporting that Diana ensured Charles saw her looking beautiful, decorous, and acting jolly, which Queen Elizabeth also noticed and remarked how she found her charming and appropriate. Referred to by the media as the Test of Balmoral, Diana and Charles got their blessing, which sparked the beginning of big public interest with a race in the press to be the first to publish photos of the lady who was dubbed Shy Di. With the couple's relationship now public, there was a threat to the royal establishment as it fueled tabloid newspapers to scrutinize and run stories on Charles and Diana, stories which could be either positive or negative. The papers cared little 
as long as the story sold. Such was the desire to uphold a positive regal image. In November 1980, the royals demanded an apology from one tabloid newspaper when it claimed Charles had used the royal train to secretly meet with Diana. This was controversial, as the tax-funded transport was intended for official public duties only. In early 1981, upon the recommendation of Charles' father, Prince Philip, Charles decided to commit to Diana, to remove the press attention and to protect Diana and himself from the possibility of damaging their reputations. Accordingly, on the 6th of February, he proposed at Windsor Castle, and Diana accepted. They officially shared the news with the BBC two weeks later in a press announcement which produced controversy when the reporter conducting the interview asked them both if they were in love. Diana swiftly replied, of course, but Charles added, whatever love means. This was interpreted by some as an early sign of division between the couple, although in the same interview, Diana showed positive signs by saying she was ready for the challenges of joining the royal establishment as she had the unwavering support of Charles. However, there were numerous other causes for concern if anyone had cared to look. Charles was already heading into his mid-thirties, while Diana was just 19, and their courtship was hardly extensive. A biography of Diana, written many years ago, concluded that Diana and Charles had only met each other 12 or 13 times when Charles proposed. It all boded ill for the future. Diana chose her own engagement ring, which was contrary to royal tradition because it was not custom-made by the royal jeweler. She chose an 18-carat white gold band adorned with a salon sapphire, picked out of a catalogue which others could purchase. It was the first indication of her desire to forge her own path as a member of the royal family, rather than following tradition. Shortly after the wedding announcement, Diana moved into Clarence House in Westminster in London, which was one of the homes of the Queen Mother, although later Diana would move to Buckingham Palace for the remainder of her engagement. She found this to be an incredibly lonely time. On the 9th of March 1981, the couple made their first appearance together at a charity musical concert at Goldsmiths Hall in central London, where Diana was met with intense press attention as she stepped out of her car in a black, shoulderless dress which was two sizes too small and revealed more than royal fashion etiquette would normally allow. One reporter suggested it was like watching Cinderella swap her rags for riches, comparing the event to a fairy tale although Diana found it an unbearable experience which set out some harsh realities about her future. Following the Goldsmiths' event, there was an after-party at Buckingham Palace where Diana met Princess Grace of Monaco, who was previously known as Grace Kelly, an Oscar-winning American actress, before marrying into royalty. Grace comforted Diana, who got upset over the appropriateness of her dress and small details of acceptable etiquette such as which arm to wear one's handbag. Bursting into tears, Diana realized that her future life would be characterized by scrutiny and pressure, which Princess Grace joked would only get worse, oddly cheering up the conversation and creating a bond between the pair. In the months leading up to the wedding, Diana grew increasingly suspicious of the relationship between Charles and Camilla, particularly so when she found a personalized bracelet that her future husband had purchased for Camilla. Diana nearly called off the wedding on this occasion, but her sisters talked her out of it and she pressed on with the engagement. Later that month, as she watched her fiancé fly from Heathrow Airport to embark on a six-week tour, Diana was pictured crying. Charles had taken a call from Camilla just before he left. On the 28th of July, 1981, Diana had a severe episode of her eating disorder bulimia, a condition which she suffered from periodically throughout her life. It was triggered, in this case, by the anticipation of her upcoming wedding the following day. She spent the night with her sister, Lady Fellows, at Clarence House, and received a signet ring from her fiancé with a note talking about his pride in her, and offering reassurance that if she looks people in the eye, she will win the hearts of the people. Diana slept poorly due to singing crowds of gathering spectators and feelings of anticipation. 
Upon waking up, she described herself as being helplessly numb as she accepted the world was watching, with foreign dignitaries from across the globe all due to attend. Getting dressed in a 9,000 pound ivory colored dress with 10,000 embroidered pearls and a 25 meter train, longer than any other seen at a royal wedding. Diana was breaking away from the royal tradition of pure white styles. On the 29th of July, 1981, Diana officially became the Princess of Wales when she married Charles to the joy of 750 million global television viewers and half a million spectators lining the streets around their chosen venue, St. Paul's Cathedral in central London. Described by many as a fairy tale wedding, it was a huge event which saw the United Kingdom have a public holiday. While there were many celebrations around the country and further afield in the Commonwealth nations such as Australia, New Zealand and Canada. At the Church of England ceremony, the couple requested to remove the traditional wife's promise to obey her husband. A decision which seems entirely modern today, but which attracted attention from the press in 1981. The wedding reception was held afterwards at Buckingham Palace, where 27 wedding cakes and an official cake supplied by the Royal Navy standing at 5 foot tall and weighing 225 pounds were served. In addition to the extravagant wedding day costs for the ceremony, there were additional security measures due to the threat from the IRA and crowd management, which meant this was an expensive event and was estimated to cost 57 million pounds. Crowds were delighted when Charles and Diana came out onto the balcony and kissed, with fireworks and 100 beacons lighting up across the country into the night. Despite the splendor of the occasion, however, it was a doomed union, in retrospect. After the wedding reception, the newlyweds were taken by carriage across the River Thames, and they then left London to start their honeymoon at the stately home Broadlands in Hampshire. From there, they flew to the Royal Yacht Britannia, three days later, for an 11-day cruise around the Mediterranean, before returning to Balmoral Castle in Scotland for a hunting trip with other members of the royal family. Diana did not have a happy honeymoon, and she cried repeatedly, while her bulimia flared up due to the immense changes she was experiencing. Each day, she found Charles' analysis of the novels he was reading to be rather tedious in what was surely a classic example of why two individuals who do not know each other should not rush into a marriage for the wrong reasons. Many pictures were taken during their stay at Balmoral, which was organized by the Royal Press Office, who, in effect, organized and engaged official touch points with the major press outlets, including tabloid newspapers. To make matters worse, during the honeymoon, Charles reportedly wore cufflinks gifted to him by Camilla, with Diana discovering where they had come from during the trip. She suspected more and more that he was still unable to move on from his old relationship. Despite this, public sentiment assumed the new Princess of Wales was happy, having just become the third highest-ranked female in Britain, according to aristocratic precedents. The newlyweds resided at Kensington Palace in London and Highgrove House in Gloucestershire after marrying. It was just after moving in to these residences that the royal family announced that Diana was pregnant on the 5th of November 1981. Two months later, she fell down some stairs at Sandringham while just 12 weeks pregnant. But fortunately, no harm befell the unborn baby. We know today that Diana intentionally caused the fall because of her growing depression and feelings of inadequacy as part of the royal establishment. To compound matters, in February 1982, pictures of Diana pregnant in a bikini were published in the media. This deeply upset the royals, with the Queen publicly condemning those who took and released the photos. On the 21st of June 1982, however, Prince William Arthur Philip Louis of Wales was born at St Mary's Hospital in London, automatically becoming second in line to the throne of Britain. This came at some personal cost to Diana as she suffered postnatal depression in the months that followed, made worse when her friend, Princess Grace of Monaco, died on the 14th of September 1982, having suffered a stroke while driving. 
resulting in her car plummeting off a cliff, with just her daughter, Princess Stephanie, surviving. Diana attended the funeral despite her husband allegedly telling her he saw no reason why she should have to attend. There, Diana wore a black dress and became the center of press attention, with some of her critics saying she appeared to thrive on it. Attracting both criticism and praise, Charles and Diana took nine-month-old Prince William on their first joint royal tour of Australia and New Zealand in March 1983. This broke royal precedence, as young children were traditionally left at home when working royals had toured the empire or Commonwealth nations in times gone by. Arriving in Alice Springs, Australia, Diana got off to a rocky start, with some of the Australian press reporting that she looked miserable as the royals sought to win the hearts and minds of the public in the Commonwealth country in order to reaffirm support in the British monarchy whose queen was still a symbolic head of state for many worldwide countries. The young baby prince stayed with a nanny at the tour base on a farm at Umagama in central Australia, as the royal couple began visiting famous sites such as the sacred Uluru, more widely known as Ayers Rock. As the tour progressed, Diana's ability to charm was complemented by her beauty and style. Her popularity was growing across the globe, even in challenging ex-colonial countries which were increasingly skeptical of the lingering ties to the British monarchy. For instance, crowds began to come out to see Diana, who, it was estimated, shook the hands of around 6,000 people during the tour of Australia, developing her popular image as someone who was accessible and relatable to the public, while also appearing down-to-earth and unafraid to break with royal protocols. The two-month tour finished a success for the royal couple, but with the limelight shifting towards Diana, there was animosity created, as Charles was used to being at the center of attention, but was at times pushed aside, which put pressure on the relationship when they arrived back to London and found it was the same at home. On the 14th of February 1984, the papers published the news of Diana's second pregnancy, having confirmed the information the night before, marking an uncharacteristic period of happiness for the couple as they grew to their closest as man and wife. With her husband wishing for a baby girl, Diana feared disappointment when she found out it was a boy and consequently decided to withhold the sex from Charles until the birth of their second child, Prince Harry on the 15th of September 1984. As a mother, Diana put her children first and often refused the wishes of Charles and royal traditions. For instance, she organized her own childcare, picking William and Harry's clothes and taking them to the school that she chose when they got older, rather than relying on royal household staff to carry out these tasks, as so many royal couples had for centuries. This all added to the growing perception of Diana as the people's princess amongst the wider public, a royal princess who seemed to have the common touch and who had little time for the rituals and stuffiness of the traditional aristocracy. Diana's royal duties recommenced in 1985 once she recovered from her pregnancy. Life as a working royal at this time involved supporting the queen as sovereign undertaking tours of the country and symbolic visits to civic and military sites, such as her launch of HMS Cornwall, where Diana continued to draw crowds and influence fashion with her manner and style. In April, Diana, Charles, William and Harry visited Italy, where they met both the Italian President Alessandro Pertini and Pope John Paul II, followed by a second trip to Australia later in the year, with the public and media nicknamed Diana the Diamond Princess. In November of that year, while attending a dinner hosted at the White House in Washington, D.C., President Ronald Reagan's wife Nancy fulfilled a fantasy of Diana's when she paired her with movie star John Travolta for a dance which cleared the floor, as influential onlookers watched the infamous moment unfold. As the year closed, Diana was immersed in typical public duties, such as visits to hospitals, schools and charities, including those supporting sufferers of serious diseases such as AIDS.
By 1986, Diana and Charles' marriage was deteriorating significantly as it became clear to Diana that Charles had once again resumed his intimate relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles. However, it would be wrong to suggest, as many people have over the years, that Diana was entirely the victim in this situation. She engaged herself in at least one and possibly multiple affairs in the 1980s. The first of these was possibly with Barry Manneke, a police officer and bodyguard who was assigned to Diana's protection unit in 1984. He was subsequently transferred away from that detail in 1986 on the grounds that his relationship with Diana had become inappropriate. He died in a road traffic accident the following year, and while the rumors of the affair were never substantiated, Diana did state in an interview some years later that she had been deeply in love with someone between 1984 and 1986, and she was devastated upon hearing of his death. A more widely known of affair was with her old horse riding instructor, Major James Hewitt, who Diana was involved with between 1986 and 1991. Diana later confirmed the affair, as did Hewitt. However, persistent theories that Prince Harry bears a striking resemblance to Hewitt and is his biological son have been rubbished by Hewitt, who stated that his affair with Diana did not begin until two years after Harry was born. What all of this makes clear, though, is that Diana was involved in several protracted affairs herself throughout her marriage to Charles. Thus, although Diana later claimed that her marriage failed because there were three people in it, her, Charles, and Camilla, in reality, Diana was unfaithful herself also for much of it. Scrutiny of the lives of the Prince and Princess of Wales persisted when Diana fainted in May during the Expo 86 World Fair in Vancouver, Canada, causing many to question her health and the busy schedule which saw her fly to Tokyo shortly after, where she was pictured looking pale and exhausted. Diana was immensely popular across the world and in Japan, which ensured the eight-day tour was action-packed, but the couple successfully hid any issues in the marriage throughout the trip. In November 1986, Diana went on a short tour of the Middle East, where she met King Fahd of Saudi Arabia and Sultan Qaboos bin Said al Said of Amman. We might ask at this juncture just who was this young woman who was involved in such tangled political affairs in the 1980s and was at one point assumed destined to become the Queen of England one day. Often Diana's personality is masked by the public adulation she received on account of her charitable activities and the perception of her as the victim of a political marriage. But who was she away from the media glare? Diana was a mix of charm and confidence, under which was hidden many insecurities and emotional storms. Friends noted that she could shift from one mood to another relatively quickly, so that the young woman who had to act one way at a royal event or was livid owing to some media report and intrusion into her life at a given time could quickly become more upbeat with friends. Other lifelong friends noted that there was a paradoxical nature to Diana. The fashion entrepreneur Roberto Dvorak, for instance, noted that Diana could be extremely mature in some instances, but conversely entirely immature in other situations. Similarly, despite the massive number of responsibilities which were foisted on her, she could also be very childlike. In many ways, this was what won her the admiration of so many, her unguarded and innocent manner, even in serious situations. Her younger brother, Charles, perhaps provided the most penetrating insight into this, noting that Diana's great strength and weakness was her honesty, and yet even this could often be disguised by her need to exaggerate. Even when she was being truthful, she was, in short, a complicated person. In April 1987, Diana opened the first UK hospital ward dedicated to the treatment of HIV, where she famously tackled the stigma around those infected with the disease when she shook the hands of 12 patients without wearing gloves. Only one picture was taken, and the 32-year-old man insisted that it should be taken from an angle where his face could not be seen. 
This reflected the fearful social outcasts that HIV created, as well as a loneliness that Diana could relate to in the confines of her own personal life within a strict establishment. Events like this might seem insignificant today, but it is important to understand exactly how unusual this behavior was in the mid-1980s. HIV and AIDS had first emerged in Africa during the 1930s, but in an age prior to rampant globalization, it took decades before it became a serious problem in the developed world. When the first major waves of it began spreading across Europe and North America in the late 1970s and early 1980s, it carried an enormous social stigma, primarily because it was believed to be transmitted exclusively by intravenous drug users and gay men, at a time when homosexuality was still looked down upon by the vast majority of people. In publicly refusing to adopt this stance towards HIV sufferers, and instead displaying a humane approach towards those who had contracted the disease, Diana contributed towards lifting some of the stigma surrounding it in the mid to late 1980s. Elsewhere in her life, in the second half of the 1980s, the tabloids continued to focus on exposing the failing marriage and had picked up on a growing discomfort between Diana and Charles, highlighting when they failed to appear together at events such as the wedding of Lady Amanda Ellingworth or the solo summer holiday Charles took at Balmoral. Diana was aware from her charity engagements that her work often benefited from the press attention, but her position also attracted relentless coverage of personal stories which she found distressing. It was also leading to an ongoing decline in her relationship with her mother-in-law. When Charles had first introduced Diana to his parents as a prospective wife, the Queen and her husband had been impressed by her and warmed to Diana. That relationship continued well through the first years of their marriage and the birth of William and Harry. But in the second half of the 1980s, it became more strained as the media focus on the problems of her and Charles's marriage continued. For Elizabeth, whose motto, as inherited from her own parents, was to never complain, never explain, a key component of which was not to air the royal family's dirty laundry in public, the breakdown of Charles and Diana's marriage created unprecedented problems in her long reign. The evidence suggests that she did not view Diana as being responsible for the problems which were growing from the mid-1980s onwards, but neither could she overlook the fact that it was the arrival of Diana into the royal fold which had led to the first serious and ongoing controversies of her reign, over 30 years after its commencement. As 1988 arrived, Diana and Charles continued with world tours including Thailand and Australia, as their official royal duties continued to grow with nearly 200 events attended that year alone. Diana remained focused on charities concerned with the treatment and support of cancer, opening what would become known as Children with Cancer UK and assuming the position of patroness, in addition to positions she already held in the Red Cross and several other charities. All of this work continued to earn her plaudits in many circles in Britain, even as the media feeding frenzy concerning her personal life continued. By 1989, Diana was living a largely separate life to her husband, and in February, while at a birthday party, she bravely confronted Camilla in a private exchange, telling her she knew about the affair and wanted her husband back. The accusation was met with denial from Camilla, and so, in the year that followed, things continued on the same trajectory. Diana continued to make headlines when she hugged a child suffering with AIDS before her busy schedule flew her on a tour of Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates the following month, with her duties now increasing to approximately 300 official engagements per year, an enormous burden for a woman who was still just in her late 20s and balancing motherhood and a very complicated personal life. In March 1990, Diana and Charles toured Nigeria and the Republic of Cameroon, where she highlighted projects which centered around women's education and healthcare. In May, the couple marked history by being the first royals to visit ex-Soviet Hungary 
which was one of many Eastern European countries that had liberated itself from a communist regime the previous year. Despite the potential Eastern conflict with the USSR apparently easing, with the Cold War coming to a largely peaceful conclusion, in the Middle East, Britain was one of 35 countries condemning Iraq for its invasion of Kuwait, triggered by an oil pricing war and deep historical disagreements. In August 1990, when Iraq refused to withdraw, the first Gulf War began, which was a conflict that would see the loss of 47 British military personnel. Diana was keen to show her support for British troops and their families, and in December she travelled to Germany, where she met British soldiers and their families who were stationed at bergen hohne garrison near Hanover. During this visit, she told the 750 military families stationed here that they would not be forgotten this Christmas time as they fought overseas. She also wrote a motivational letter to the troops, one which was published through the British military's internal communications in the new year. In 1991, Diana's royal duties included a trip to Kingston in Canada, a solo trip to Pakistan, and a visit to Brazil, where she highlighted organizations that were trying to tackle poverty and provide relief to homeless children. In her role as a mother, Diana continued to be dedicated to her children and was characteristically unfazed by royal protocol when she competed in Harry's school sports day event running barefoot in a skirt during a race between the parents. In June, when Prince William suffered a head injury from a golf club and was hospitalized, Diana spent the whole night at his bedside, making sure he was okay, following a successful operation. In July 1991, Marking their 10-year wedding anniversary, Charles and Diana went to Highgrove House in Gloucestershire, which was a property the family often went to on weekends, but the trip also attracted rumours in the press due to its proximity to Camilla's residence. In August, the family and close friends went on a private holiday to Italy, which some headlined as a second honeymoon, when in reality it was a family break rather than a romantic rekindling with Diana already confiding about her unhappy marriage to her lifelong friend James Colthurst in a series of secretly recorded interviews during the year. In February 1992, Charles and Diana shared what would be one of their last royal tours together in India, where Diana met Mother Teresa and was famously pictured sitting alone without her husband in front of the Taj Mahal photos which fueled press speculation around the marriage once again when they appeared in the British newspapers. In June 1992, the breaking point of the relationship was reached when a book entitled Diana, Her True Story by Andrew Morton was released. This documented Diana's life, including her relationship with Charles and details of his affair with Camilla throughout their marriage. Although in her lifetime she would always deny any involvement in the book, Morton's work was based on interview recordings of conversations between Diana and James Colthurst. Colthurst evidently acted as a middleman for Diana's version of events, which she was keen to be directly heard rather than spun through the royal press office. In response to this publicity crisis, the Queen and Prince Philip intervened to try to protect the establishment, but mediation did not work, and in August 1992, the situation escalated when a private tape recording was leaked to the press between Diana and a childhood friend, James Gilby, in which Diana described her marriage as torture with a feeling of being trapped. There was no confirmation that Diana and James were having an affair. However, she expressed concern their recent meeting may be discovered, while he used affectionate terms and the pet name Squidge several times, resulting in the publication and furore surrounding it becoming known as Swidgygate. Conspiracy theorists believe the timing of the leaked recordings were an attempt to tarnish public support and empathy for Diana, which had grown following the revelations of Morton's book. And although there was no evidence to this effect, it is an example of how conspiracy theories began to increase as people in the public and royal establishment started to pick sides. In November 1992, there was a final attempt to show the world the marriage could be salvaged when Charles and Diana were sent on a four-day royal tour of South Korea. But the pictures that were taken during the trip had the opposite effect, 
with the couple looking unhappy and described as the glums, a description of them which had first surfaced in the 1980s. Meanwhile, back in England, the Queen herself made a rare public statement about her feelings about the controversy Diana and Charles's marital woes was generating, combined with other family difficulties. In a speech she delivered on the 24th of November 1992, commemorating the 40th anniversary of her accession to the throne, she stated, 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis, or horrible year. Just two weeks later, at the Queen's request, the Conservative Prime Minister John Major officially announced that Charles and Diana had amicably decided to separate but had no plans to divorce, with their constitutional positions unaffected and the parental custody of their two sons equally split. Damage limitation to the establishment was the likely driving force for the announcement, as it included particular emphasis that there was no third party involved in the couple's decision, although this did not subdue press speculation. In January 1993, a leaked intimate conversation between Charles and Camilla, recorded four years earlier, was released to the Australian tabloid newspapers before being sent to the press in Britain and around the world. The nature of the conversation reflected poorly on Charles and resulted in Camilla getting vilified by many newspapers. Diana reacted privately to the transcript in disgust, but also appeared to be boosted by her husband's public embarrassment, declaring to her bodyguard that it was game, set and match in the battle for public opinion. In March, Diana went on her first solo royal trip following the separation, when she visited a leprosy hospital in Nepal and famously met patients in an attempt to remove another widely held stigma. Despite the normal persistence of everyday duties, Diana and her opinion of Charles continued to deteriorate, when, in a letter to her bodyguard in June, she accused him of being in a relationship with his personal assistant, Tiggy Leg Burke, whom he had hired as a nanny for Harry and William, which Diana resented. A Tiggy and Charles relationship was never proven and it seems doubtful that it ever occurred. In the months that followed, Diana was consumed with the separation and, in particular, the ever-present public eye, so much so that by December 1993, she re-evaluated her life and declared in a statement that she was taking a step back from public life due to the intense press intrusion of the past 12 years and the consequent pressure on her personal life. Stressing her continued involvement in charity work, she thanked the public for its support and advised that she would now engage in a more sustainable work-life balance where her duties could be fulfilled, while also maintaining some level of personal privacy. In June 1994, right around the time that Diana attended the 50th anniversary of the D-Day landings in northern France, Charles had been Prince of Wales for 22 years, and to celebrate, he was interviewed by journalist Jonathan Dimbleby for a documentary which covered his royal duties worldwide for almost a year, while also giving him the platform from which he chose to speak about his marriage. Around 13 million viewers watched as he admitted to adultery, adding that it was only after the marriage was irreparable and confirming the next day that the affair was with Camilla. This news was not a revelation, as by that time, the press had uncovered affairs involving both parties in the marriage, but it was a shock to the public to hear it from the future king's own lips and created further divisions between those who supported Diana and those who were sympathetic to Charles. On the same evening that the interview was aired, attending a dinner event in the Serpentine Gallery, London, Diana wore an evening gown styled outside the normal confines of royal conservatism. This resulted in it becoming popularly referred to as the revenge dress, with some journalists saying it symbolized Diana's breaking free from the rules of the royal establishment and taking back control of her life. In January 1995, Camilla and her husband Andrew Parker Bowles announced plans to divorce, reigniting speculation around the status of her rekindled relationship with Charles. In the months that followed, Diana did not react publicly, 
but instead focused on her duties when she made a royal visit to Emperor Akihito in Japan, the Venice Biennale Art Festival, and a trip to Moscow, where she received the International Leonardo Prize in recognition of her charity work. In November, Diana took part in a television interview with the BBC, which was organized with some deceitful manipulation from the producer and presenter Martin Bashir, but aired with probing questions into personal details and specifically her failed marriage, with which Diana ultimately cooperated as she anticipated a legal clause that would mute her version of events with a divorce now inevitable. Public interest spiked and Diana put herself back into the press limelight following her break. This resulted in split opinions, with some saying she was unjustly trying to portray herself as a victim of psychological abuse from Charles, while others backed her for bravely speaking out against an archaic establishment who were not supporting a vulnerable family member. When the interview aired, it caused crisis for the royal image, with quotes that suggested Diana did not see Charles as a suitable heir to the throne, and confirmed that both of them were involved in extramarital affairs. The Queen consequently wrote letters to both Diana and Charles, advising them to finalize their divorce and end the never-ending press attention with all the associated negative insights into the royal family. Unsurprisingly, Charles accepted the Queen's recommendation. Diana was upset by the letter, as she felt she was being told to agree to the divorce rather than being asked, but she eventually accepted. Divorce negotiations were concluded on the 28th of August 1996, with joint custody of the children, a lump sum of £17 million, and an annual allowance of £400,000 awarded to Diana, retaining the title of Princess of Wales, while losing the title Her Royal Highness. All royal duties would continue until, as and when, she remarried. In January 1997, as patron of the Halo Trust, Diana was famously seen being guided round a minefield in Angola in southern Africa. This was one of many locations that the Trust aimed to remove explosive ordinances from, which were killing or maiming people every day. Angola having become the scene of a protracted and bitter civil war and a front in the Cold War from the mid-1970s onwards, as it sought to achieve independence from Portugal. The visit attracted some criticism from a distinguished member of the British Ministry of Defence, Earl Howe, who described Diana as interfering with politics, which was strictly prohibited by royal convention. But despite this complaint, the pictures of her wearing a flak jacket and helmet went to print around the world, as she again successfully raised awareness of a charitable cause. Back in Britain, following the divorce, Diana remained in Kensington Palace, having been there since she married Charles, and was still a very influential figure, associating herself with a wide range of people, including celebrity friends such as Elton John and George Michael. She continued to be linked to men romantically, and those closest to Diana recall her describing heart surgeon Hasnat Khan as the love of her life when she dated him between 1995 and 1997, although it remains unclear who ended the relationship. Within one month, she was dating Dodi Fayette, who was the wealthy son of the owner of Harrods Department Store. In the summer of 1997, Diana was invited by Dodi to spend time with him on holiday on his yacht in the south of France. William and Harry joined them there for a period of time, before she and Dodi later returned on their own, where the paparazzi captured the couple kissing. The paparazzi were independent photographers who sold their pictures to newspapers, and although they always had interest in Diana, their methods of obtaining pictures were becoming more aggressive, with them focusing on and following every move their target made. Flying from Sardinia to Paris, Diana and Dodi were followed as they had dinner on the 30th of August at the Ritz Hotel in the French capital, with the paparazzi waiting outside on motorbikes, ready to take pictures when the couple left. Upon arriving at the hotel, Diana had called her two sons, who were at Balmoral Castle, with Charles. She also later called a journalist friend, whom she informed that she was about to make a drastic change in her life. 
fulfilling her remaining royal duties before removing herself from public attention for good. After this, the couple ate dinner in their suite, during which Dodi became suspicious that some of the staff in the restaurant were paparazzi. Consequently, they left through the back of the hotel in a black Mercedes and headed for his apartment at 12.20 a.m. on the 31st of August. Diana and Dodi sat in the back of the car, while their chauffeur Henri Paul drove with their bodyguard Trevor Rhys Jones sat in the passenger seat as they raced ahead of the pursuing paparazzi through the streets of Paris towards the Pont d'Almar tunnel. At 12.23 a.m., driving at speeds of 85 miles per hour, the Mercedes clipped another car at the entrance to the tunnel, which resulted in them crashing into a pillar. Paul and Dodi died instantly in what was described by a witness as an impact which sounded like an explosion. A doctor by the name of Frédéric Maillet, who was driving past in the opposite direction, stopped his car when he saw the crash and ran towards the scene. When he reached the car, he found Rhys Jones severely injured. Diana was on her knees, facing the seat. When Maillet approached, she looked up and asked him what had happened and then complained of the pain she was in, before lowering her head and going quiet. As rescuers arrived to the scene in the hour that followed, Diana went into cardiac arrest as they attempted to cut her from the wreckage. Her heart was displaced and her pulmonary vein was torn. Despite resuscitation and hours of surgery at Petit Solpertrier Hospital, the Princess of Wales was declared dead at 4 a.m. Rhys Jones was the only survivor, and an investigation found that he was the only person in the car wearing a seatbelt. The post-mortem revealed that the driver, Henri Paul, was intoxicated and under the side effects of prescription drugs, which combined with his decision or instruction to drive recklessly resulted in the crash. Dodi's father subsequently suggested one of many unproven conspiracy theories that this was not an accident but a planned murder by people who feared the damage Diana's knowledge could do to the royal establishment. But no evidence to substantiate this claim has ever surfaced. Instead, the death of Diana will be remembered in history as a tragic accident, taking the life of a 36-year-old lady who was looking forward to a new future following her divorce. These conclusions were confirmed by Operation Paget an inquiry carried out by the British Metropolitan Police between 2004 and 2006. This found that Henri Paul was intoxicated on the night in question, and this, combined with the actions of the paparazzi who were chasing the car, resulted in what was later declared an unlawful killing due to gross negligence. The inquiry also confirmed that Diana had not been pregnant at the time of her death, a suspicion that had lingered ever since the events of 1997. On the 6th of September 1997, following tributes from all over the world, Diana's funeral took place at Westminster Abbey, with her sons, Charles, the Duke of Edinburgh, and her brother, walking behind her coffin as a crowded procession led her to the public service, which was broadcast to approximately 2.5 billion viewers worldwide. Later in the day, her body was buried in a private ceremony within the grounds of her family estate, Althrop Park. She was dressed in a black dress and had the rosary beads that Mother Teresa had gifted her when they met. Diana is remembered as a fashion icon, charity ambassador, and someone who could be related to by the British public, with her displays of empathy and compassion and her often down-to-earth behavior. The dresses she wore still influenced fashion long after her death, while she also did a lot to promote aspiring British fashion designers through her roles as patron and associations with key figures within the industry. Her charity work and particular focus on causes that carried stigmas in the 1980s enabled Diana to raise the profile and encourage support time after time which undoubtedly helped many people suffering from diseases such as HIV, AIDS, and leprosy. All of this ensured that she is remembered as the people's princess, someone who was not afraid of stretching traditionally reserved royal protocols 
by showing emotions that the average Western person is familiar with. Beautiful and socially charming, she drew attention at events and often used this for the good of promoting others as well as themes that she was passionate about. Conversely, Diana will also be associated with an unhappy marriage and a conflicting relationship between her desire to utilize the media and the invasive pressure this invited, and which she ultimately could not control. She felt trapped within the confines of the royal establishment, and within a marriage where both parties committed adultery. Worse still, all of this played out publicly every step of the way. For a vulnerable young woman who suffered from mental health problems and bulimia, the confident persona often hid a person who struggled with life and failed to find enough support or empathy to relieve the many internal struggles she faced. Speaking out and airing personal details about the royal family is remembered by some as Diana's betrayal to an iconic establishment that she chose to join and from which she reaped the power and influence that came from that decision. Opinion on her decision to do the BBC interview in the mid-1990s and to contribute to Morton's tell-all book divided public opinion both then and ever since. There is a postscript to the tragedy of Diana's early death and the spectacle which her life became. On the 9th of April 2005, Prince Charles finally married Camilla Parker Bowles at the end of what was effectively a three decades long and enormously complicated courtship. This royal wedding was kept low key and involved a small civil ceremony near Windsor Castle as it was rightly perceived that it would be controversial even with the passage of eight years since Diana's death. With the crowning of Prince Charles as King Charles III on the 6th of May 2023, Camilla was crowned as Queen Consort, like previous royal spouses before her. This was a decision which was made by Queen Elizabeth II on her Platinum Jubilee in February 2022, just months before her own death. This was not seen as the controversial decision that it once might have been. Many years ago, Charles and Camilla were perceived as the villains in the story of Diana's life. But in reality, there were no villains in Diana and Charles' story, simply a misguided decision to marry, which both parties entered into of their own volition. What happened afterwards was the result of largely inevitable media intrusion. Of course, Charles' coronation would be controversial for other reasons, in 2022, Diana's son, Harry, together with his wife, Meghan Markle, publicly drew parallels with her story, highlighting the invasive nature of the press and confines of royal life becoming unbearable, much as they were at times for the late Princess of Wales. In the same year as Harry withdrew further from his old royal life, Queen Elizabeth II died. Following her death, Charles ascended as king. Prince William became the new heir to the throne, and as a result, his wife Catherine became Princess of Wales, which was the title so famously held by his late mother. And so the hereditary royal establishment continues towards a new generation, apparently still grappling with its relationship with the media and public identity, while the impact of Diana's legacy can still be seen from her far-reaching life as a princess, style icon, patron, wife, and mother. What do you think of Diana, Princess of Wales? Was Diana's media attention damaging or progressive for the royal establishment? And how do you think Diana has influenced the public perception of the royal family? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.